today, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll step away from the book of Matthew for a little bit and study some scripture in the book of Romans that echoes what we just heard the choir sing about. Um, and I'll tell you what, I got into the book of Romans ostensibly to um, preach a little sermonette on Wednesday night in that special service we had for the cross. And I couldn't get out. Got in Romans and I couldn't get out. So this might be a hint as to where we're going next after Matthew. All right, this, uh, this might be the place we go. But the, the, the idea that we'll talk about today, uh, from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39, will be answering some questions that have been obliterated by the resurrection. Questions, and, and you might think that word obliterate, where that come from, and that that comes from the language that we'll read about today, the language that, that Paul uses to write here in this passage of, of Romans. He, he talks about conquering, and we're talking about squashing, and we're talking about obliterating. And guys, this is the power of the cross, this is the power of the resurrection. That's what it does. Uh, it, 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 it not only obliterates death, but it obliterates the, the stain of sin in our lives. If, if we simply surrender, it just obliterates so much stuff. And, and, and there, there are several questions then that, that we'll need to examine <coughs> and see what the resurrection does to these questions in our lives. So, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray about it. Father, we're grateful to be able to uh, study this, this wonderful passage of Scripture today. And God, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit working in every person here does so much more with this than I could ever do with my power. Father, I, I, I pray that you give uh, understanding and application to each person here. Speak, uh, speak individually to the people that are gathered here. And, and Father, I pray that we walk out of here saying, what just happened? I pray, Father, that, that we walk out of here having seen a, a, a remix <coughs> of your Holy Spirit in, in, in lives like we've never seen before. And that, Father, it is clear that it's because of you. It's clear it's because of uh, the resurrected Christ. And it's clear because of the Holy Spirit who is alive and well and, and living in us. I pray, God, that you will be honored and greatly glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, guys, as I said, a few questions that we want to ask and answer today through the Scripture. And, and these aren't questions that I've made up. These are the questions that Paul asks as he goes through this particular section. And perhaps you'll see that uh, they're largely rhetorical, uh, but they are questions that, for much of the world, aren't necessarily rhetorical questions, as they are for Paul. And, and the first question that will be asked is, is there confidence in knowing God? Is there confidence that comes from knowing God? However, however you want to phrase it, David. But you see, that, that's kind of what's asked here in verses 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So this is the question of, of, of confidence. Here's their confidence in knowing God. And Paul's answer clearly is, is yes. <clears throat> the answer that, that he has for this is, is, is even in the question that he's asking. Yes, there is confidence in knowing God. Because the, the, the reason that you see the, that he is answering yes is because if God is for me, then who, who can be against me? If God is for me, who, who is against me? There is great confidence, Paul is saying, in knowing God. Not just knowing God who he is. Not just knowing that, hey, there's a God out there somewhere. I believe there's a God. But we're talking about knowing. We're talking about having a relationship. We're talking about the, this, this intimate level of knowing someone. As in, as in knowing your, 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 your spouse or knowing your children. Knowing, knowing people on this intimate relationship. This, this is the confidence that comes from knowing God. From being in relationship with God. Not just some laissez-faire type of acknowledging that a God exists. But knowing God, in, in knowing God comes confidence. Now, the thing about it is, as much as we can know it, as much as we can have full confidence that comes from knowing God, most of the world questions that. Most of the world will question whether or not you can know God. Most of the world will ask these questions, well, is there even a God? Can I know there's God. How can I have confidence in knowing that there's God? I can't see him. I've, I've never heard him. You know, I, I just don't have the, the evidence that I need, people will say, to, to know that there's God. People will ask these questions. People will ask, how do you know your way is right? Well, if there is a God, how do you know that, that what you do is the right way to, to know him and, 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 and get to him and, and to, to know him Forever. How do you know that, that this God won't turn against you at the end? You know, when, when it comes down to it, how do you know that he won't all of a sudden go evil and, and, and you should have chosen another God? You see, the, the world has, has all kinds of questions. Maybe, maybe someone out here has, has asked questions like this. Maybe you still have questions like that. And so there is not this confidence that Paul has um, that maybe you don't have it. Not everyone has this same type of confidence. So, where does Paul get this confidence? Where does Paul get the confidence to say, if God is for me, then who can be against me? If God is for me, then no one else stands a chance. Where does this confidence come from? His confidence is rooted in sacrifice. His confidence, as we see in, in verse 32, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. This is, this is the, the thesis statement here for, for him being able to have this confidence and make such a confident and bold statement. The confidence comes from the sacrifice. The confidence comes from knowing that God sent his son Jesus to die for us. Now why does that give him confidence? Why in the world does that give him such confidence? I believe that, that he's drawing confidence from this, and you and I should drive confidence from this, because of the fact that this is not some spur-of-the-moment decision that God made. God, God didn't just, you know, he, he wasn't sitting there in eternity and, and said, you know what, fellas, let's do this. Hey, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let's just do this. But let's, let's devise this plan and you and then you go and die for everybody and and, and they'll love us. They'll love us. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't like that. This was, a, this was a plan that was rooted before the foundation of the world. And, and that's important to get. It's important for us to understand. I believe the scriptures teach us that God's plan for redeeming man was in place before he created man. God's plan for redeeming man was in place before he created mankind. God knew in creating that man would fall and there would need to be this redemption. And so the, the confidence that Paul has comes from the fact that this plan was in place before the fall, even before creation. 
And that's good. And, and, and that can give you confidence because you know then that, hey, this is a God who's thought of it all. This is a God who's not caught off guard. A God who's not caught by surprise. God is not a God who created man and then man sinned, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and it wasn't like God said, ooh, didn't see that coming. Right? That's, that's not the God we serve. That's not the God of the scriptures. This Because I don't know that I can have much confidence in that God. If, if, if that was the type of God that Paul is writing about here, I don't know that Paul would write, if this God is for me, who could be against me? Does that sound like someone that you could say that about? If you said, oh, I didn't see that coming. No. We wouldn't have great confidence. We couldn't have this superior, unmatched confidence in a God like that. And so that, that's why I, I want you to see that this, this idea that this sacrifice of Jesus was rooted in the foundation of the world. It was hatched. It was in place before the creation of man. Forget about the, the, the fall of man. It was in place before the creation of man. This makes him a God that I can have all confidence in. I can have all confidence in him because he's covered every base. He's thought of every angle. He won't be caught off guard. He's not been caught off guard. He never will be caught off guard. And that's not just in this situation. This is in every situation in your life. You see, this is where the personal application comes. That you trust him and you can trust that he's, that he's seen every angle. He, he's thought of everything. Now, this does not mean that no one will ever be against us. Understand what Paul's saying here. If God is for me, then who can be against me? If God is for us, who can be against us? This does not mean that no one will ever stand up against you, does it? That's not what he's getting at here. It doesn't mean that the enemy, Satan and his demons, people influenced by his demons, it doesn't mean that they'll never make any headway in your life. Because you and I will fall to sin, will fall prey to temptation, Will, will, will be attacked by people and it will seem that sometimes like they're winning. And it will seem sometimes like Satan is winning. It will seem sometimes like this fallen world is winning. So have, having confidence that this is the God who is for us, no, that who can be against us, it, it doesn't mean that people won't rise up against you. It doesn't mean that circumstances won't rise up against us. But what Paul is getting at here is they don't have a chance. They, don't have to, they are doomed to failure. The, the world and, and, and whoever, the, the forces that may come up against you are ultimately doomed to failure. And this is where we have, the, we have to start having the bigger picture in mind, just like God the Father has the bigger picture in mind. You see, as God looks at creating, looked at creating the world, he had the bigger picture in mind, seeing that man would fall and man would need to be redeemed. He, he saw the bigger picture. So you and I, it, it, in order to have this confidence in knowing God, we have to look at the bigger picture too. And we can't let then our, our confidence be shaken when something happens. When some person rises up. When some situation rises up that doesn't look like God's in it. That, 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 that is not what I would expect. I can't have my confidence shaken by that because I have to be looking at the bigger picture and know that this is ultimately doomed to failure. Whatever things may rise up against are doomed to failure. That's the idea that Paul is communicating here. We can have confidence in knowing God because we know that ultimately he will never be defeated. And that means then that you and I, as his heirs, as his children, we share in that promise that ultimately we will not be defeated. There is greater confidence in knowing God. Next question that, that we'll see that, that he gets at here is, what is the basis for my standing before God? What's the basis for my standing before God? How is it that I can know where I stand before God? How is it that I can, tie into this confidence, have confidence that I'm okay with God? How can I know that and know that for sure? Verses 33 and 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? 
Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So, we see very quickly here, as you read these verses, that, that the, the foundation here, it, prior, as we were, the last, in the last section we were talking about, confidence and knowing, that was rooted in the sacrifice. Here, the confidence is in standing, which rooted in the resurrection. As Paul says, the, 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 the one who was killed, rather raised. So the emphasis here is on the one who was resurrected. And in the resurrected Christ, then, <coughs> we have confidence in our standing before God. Because he very clearly points out here that, that God is the one who justifies, but who's the one that, that intercedes? The one that intercedes, the one who intercedes is Jesus Christ. Who is he interceding for? He's interceding for you and for me. He's interceding for those who would surrender to him. He's interceding for those who would, who would believe that he is the intercessor. The ones who, who submit to that. The ones who, who surrender that, to that. And, and so it, it's in that intercession, it's in that one who was resurrected then, that I can have confidence in my standing before God. I can have confidence because my standing is not based on me. My standing before God is not based on what I've done. It's not based on what I've done compared to what you've done. And your confidence is not based on what you've done compared to what I've done or compared to what that bad person on TV has done. Your confidence and your standing before God is based on the resurrected God. Your confidence and standing before God is based in the resurrected Jesus Christ. This is our confidence. This is how I can know that I stand before God because this, this Jesus Christ who died and was resurrected, this Jesus Christ who said all these things about being God, who said all these things about being the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me. Hey, he beat death. I can believe what he said. I can believe it. I can believe that he said that it's through him. And so then when I believe that, when I surrender to that, when I submit to that, guess what that means? He is at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. He's interceding for me. Now, if you can't have confidence in someone who beat death, I don't know who you can have confidence in. You see, the grave, the grave did not hold him. The grave could not handle him. He, he defeated death. This, this resurrection is his and, and his alone. And he is the one who intercedes for you and for me. Let that be great confidence for you. And let this be a reminder that that's the only confidence you can have in your standing before God. So many of us, so many of us count on, as, as I stated earlier, alluded to a little bit earlier, so many of us count on the things we've done. So many of us try to base our confidence. You, you talk, how many times have, have I asked people, you die today, where are you going to heaven? Why are you going to heaven? Because I've lived a good life. There's no confidence in that, guys. There's no confidence in your good life. I'm sorry. I know that might be a blow to some of you. That might especially be a, be a blow to some grandmothers thinking about their sweet little grandbabies. But no matter how precious and sweet they are, no matter what good things they did back in the end, and all you think about is the way they were when they were six. That goodness and that precious face does not give them confidence before God. That does not give them a confident standing before God. That does not give you, that does, does, does not give me, does not give any of us confident standing before God. The only thing that does is the resurrected Jesus Christ. Because of his resurrection, you can believe the things that he said, and you can stand confidently before God. You can know that you're comp that you are either justified. Hey, and listen, let's talk about this for a minute. The confidence works both ways. <laughs> you can confidently know that you're either justified or condemned. Because every single person here knows what you've done with Jesus. Don't sit here and try to fool me today or fool anyone here thinking, well, you know, I'm kind of in this limbo, in this gray area with Jesus. You're not in a gray area. You're either justified 
or you're condemned. And you know. You know. Man, my heart beats today that <laughs> man, my hope, my prayer is that every every person who's sitting here today can 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 say with confidence that I know I am justified before God. <clears throat> That's what my heart hopes and prays. But you know my brain tells me that there's at least someone here who's, who can't sit here and, and say with all confidence that I'm justified before God. My brain tells me that there's probably someone here wrestling with that, that there's probably someone who if you honestly examine your heart and your life, the answer is, I'm condemned. I'm condemned. And God, the, the, the plea is simple. It's so easy to fix. It, 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 it's so easy to fix. It, it's just a, a simple act of, of surrender. It's a simple act of, 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 of understanding and believing who Jesus says that, that he was and Jesus says that he is and the scriptures teach us that he is the, the way, the truth, and the life. And, and it's simply surrendering to that. Say, yeah, I believe it, and, and, and He is my Lord, and He is my Savior. It, it, it's a simple thing, but one of the hardest things for most people to do. Because you've got to remove yourself from the equation. You've got to remove yourself from that equation and, and, and stop, stop trying. You've got to stop trying. That's hard for us, isn't it? Because ingrained into our minds, ingrained into our brains, from the time we're little until the time we get a job, you're on a football field, you're on a baseball field, you're at work, you're in school, you gotta just, man, just try harder, push harder, study more, work longer. And, and, and none of that's wrong when it comes to work and school and sports. That's not wrong, that's not bad. But it's wrong and it's bad and it's death when we apply it to living forever. Don't try harder. Stop trying harder when it comes to living forever. <clears throat> you see that the, the trying, <laughs> the hard work was accomplished on the cross and through the resurrection. The hard work is done. It's done for you and it's done for me. What we have to do is surrender. And once we surrender, yeah, there is the hard work that we put in, that we put in through the Holy Spirit living in us that moves us then to produce fruit, to give evidence that we are saved. But that hard work is a joy. And that hard work is not about saving us or saving ourselves. It's about giving glory and honor to our God. You know if you're justified or you're condemned. We're going to do about it today. This last question we'll look at is this. Is there anything that can separate us from the love of Christ? Is there anything that can separate us from the love of Christ? Here's a big, here's a big one. The big question that, that so many people ask. So many people, in some form or another, so many, probably everyone here has, has, has wondered this, has thought this, has stated this in, in some way. Man, I, I, I've just done too much for God to love me. What, man, you know, I used to go to church and I used to do this and I, and I really loved God, but then I messed up. And I did this, and I don't believe there's any way God can forgive me. My life is just in, in too much of a shambles right now. There's no way 
that that can be fixed. <coughs> There's no way God could love someone like me. You know the things I've done, the things I've thought. You know what I was looking at just this morning. There's no way you might be thinking that God could love me. And the, question, the way Paul puts it here is, is there anything, is there anything that can separate from God's love? Is there anything? And understand, he, he's talking in the context here of, of you know, when I have it. <laughs> when I have received God's love. When I, it, you know, the, the idea here is that this love is, is through and in Jesus Christ. So once I've surrendered, is there anything, is there anything too bad where God would say, you know, you're not mine. You used to be mine, but you're not mine anymore. Could God ever do that? Could God ever say, you used to be mine, you're not mine anymore? Could God say, I used to want you to be mine, but not anymore? Could God ever do that? What's Paul saying? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? He gets to a lot of natural stuff here. Right? Natural disaster type stuff. Is, is, there, is there anything, any storm, any tribulation, any, any financial market, any financial crisis, any, is there anything like this that can separate me from God? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. The we here, the Godhead. You see, this, this death of Jesus, this was a fully God thing, right? This is the slaughter. This is this is the, the perfection. This is why he died. He didn't die so things could be taken from him. He didn't die so so that what, what he thought was his could be taken away from him. He died to seal what was his. His death and his resurrection seal those things that are his. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Y'all want to answer this for me? Is there anything that can separate us from God's love? Is there anything? Take it loud. There isn't. There is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Man, Satan gets in our heads and he plants these ideas in our hearts and our minds that I've done way too much. I've done this. I've done that. And just, hey, when you're thinking, just, just open this. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and read. And be reminded that there is nothing, nothing that can separate you from God's love. When you're His, remember the key that we read a couple times there, in Him, in Jesus, and through His love, through Jesus and in, in, in the love of Christ. The, these are the keys now. It, it, but, but when I'm there, when I have surrendered, when I have said, I am yours, there is nothing. There is nothing. And, and, and keep in mind, he, he kind of sums it up. He says, no created thing. And guess who that includes? That includes you. That includes me. I can't even mess this up for me. You can't mess this up for you. Man, some, some of you guys, you are beating yourself up. And you've been beating yourself up for a long time. Thinking that surely God can't love me because I have just, I, I just messed up so many times. You're beating yourself up for no reason at all. You're beating yourself up and you're a pawn of Satan rather than an instrument of the one living God. That's, that's who you become. That's who you become. And, and, and that's really all Satan can do. All he can do is, is, is make you less effective for God. All he can do is make you less fruitful. Because he can't, he can't change God's love for you. 
but he can get in your head and make you think that you're nothing, that you're worthless, that you can do nothing for the kingdom of God, and so you may as well give up. You may as well just keep on falling prey to that addiction of drugs or alcohol or sex or porn or whatever it is. You may as well just keep going with that. You may as well just keep going with the lies to your wife. You may as well just keep going with the lies to your husband. You may as well just keep going with beating them or beating your kids or being an absentee father or an absentee mother. You may as well just keep going that way because you can never change that. Those are lies, guys. Those are lies of Satan. Because the scripture, just, the scripture we just read tells me that. But you and I buy into this. We buy into this day after day. People buy people in the church. Church saved people. Buy into these lies every day. And we think there's nothing we can do about it. But guys, we, we understand here through this scripture. The truth of what Paul tells us is that through Jesus, in the love that is Jesus Christ, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. We conquer. Do you hear this language? Do you hear this? Paul uses this language of con We are conquerors. We are conquerors. When's the last time you thought of church people as conquerors? Most times people don't think that way, do they? Most of the man, I'm, I'm here to tell you. Most people, when they think of, especially dudes in church, they ain't thinking of conquerors. They're thinking of soft, soft dudes who wear yellow shirts. <laughs> that, that's the impression that so many people have. That's the impression that a lot of people bring to the game. A lot of people think, well, you know, when, when I become a Christian, you know, I, I, I've got to, you know, this meek, little, humble, little... And yeah, we are to be meek, and we are to be gentle, and we are to be humble, but we're also to be as wise as serpents. And we're also to be conquerors, man. We don't just roll over to Satan and his ploys and his games. We don't just roll over to these attitudes that, that, can, that want to take over our lives. We don't roll over to these things. Embrace this idea. Embrace this idea, this fact, this truth. That Paul gives us, that the Holy Spirit through Paul gives us that, that we are conquerors. Conquerors. Maybe some of you may be thinking, I like the idea of being a conqueror. I like this idea. That this changes things. Yeah, it does change things. You embrace the idea of being a conqueror and it will change your life. You embrace the idea of being a conqueror through Jesus Christ, it changes your life. It changes your family. It changes your church. It changes your town. It changes your state. It changes your world. And it's all because you decided to believe Scripture. Ooh. You and I got to decide to believe what God has said. God has said we are conquerors. <clears throat> Let's act like it. Let's pray. Father, just as you've conquered death, you've conquered sin on the cross, you've conquered death through the resurrection. And in this conquering, you give us a model for behavior, a model for living, a model for, for being your children, for being heirs to your kingdom. And that model is of being conquerors. Every man, woman, child who has surrendered to Jesus Christ and who will surrender to Jesus Christ in order for him to, to live in and through us, God, we become conquerors. Father, help us not to cower to sin. I pray, Father, that, that we recognize that, that you've already given us the help. The help is there. The help is available. You live in us. Your scripture girds us and leads us to have the answers. 
Father, help us to believe it. Help us to live it. Father, I, I pray for, for folks here today, folks who, who may listen uh, on the internet one day, and maybe they're, they're getting that question, that examination <coughs> question we talked about earlier, justified or condemned. Justified or condemned. Father, I pray that people are able to deal honestly with that question today. Father, people, as they examine their hearts and they're, and they're asking that question, Am I, do I stand justified before you or do I stand condemned before you, God? Man, Father, if we stand before you justified, help us to embrace that and then embrace that idea of becoming conquerors. <coughs> Father, if, we stand, if there are people who examine their hearts today and they find I stand condemned, help them to recognize and remember how simple and quick and easy it can be to stand justified. That justification happens in an instant. It happens in a moment. Father, I pray that, that people will recognize the truth of that and move from being condemned to being justified today and move from being justified to being conquerors. Help us to embrace the fullness of what it means to be yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, we'll have a time to respond this morning.